Nucleic acids are one of the four basic macromolecules, right? So we have to break them down into smaller parts. So we know that DNA, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid, and then we have RNA, ribonucleic acid, and don't forget ATP. So all of these have what are called smaller breakdown of these is called nucleotides. And nucleotides are broken down into a nitrogenous base, right? A, T, C, G, and then U for RNA. Sugar. I'll give you a little hint, it's usually ribose or deoxyribose. And what else? Anybody know? Begins with a P, ends in a fate. Phosphate. Phosphate. Okay, so let's break down the difference. The big thing for our test, again, it's going to get pretty intense, but for our test, we just should know the difference between DNA and RNA, the basic differences. Anybody remember which of those two does not leave the nucleus? Let's start there. Anybody know? DNA or RNA? Which one stays in the nucleus? Let's get this down right now. It's DNA. DNA. DNA stays in the nucleus. Remember that. Of the cell. Of the nucleus of the cell. But we didn't even learn the nucleus yet. That's a good point. So later on, we'll see that in a couple of minutes. We'll see where the nucleus is. So DNA really never leaves the nucleus, never goes into the cytoplasm, never leaves the cell. So that's important. So nucleotides are the building blocks. You have the sugar, the phosphate, and the nitrogenous base, A, T, C, G, and U, replaces T in RNA. So you have a single carbon ring and nitrogen, like these are the smaller ones, because the purines have a little bit larger. They have two rings. So pyrimidines are your C, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And uracil is an RNA, replacing thymine from DNA. And the larger ones are guanine and adenine. And that's how they actually hydrogen bond, A to T, C to G. Remember that. A, T, C, G is the way they bond. That's why I say it that way. Okay, so you see the, the purine here and the purine here binding with a pyrimidine. And remember, in RNA, the uracil will replace the thymine, okay, the nucleotide. <clears throat> and here they are. I don't like these, just put the G, T, C, and A. Guanine, thymine, cytosine, and adenine. So now we're talking about DNA, because why are we talking about DNA? Because we said thymine, we didn't say uracil, okay? So here's the way it bonds, the oxyribose, there's the sugar, correct? And that bonds with the phosphate group. So that forms like the, the ladders on the sides, you know, like in the double stride against, I'm terrible at drawing helixes. So. so it forms a long chain, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And you'll see how the bases are gonna bind through hydrogen bonds. Remember, these are gonna be hydrogen bonds. Remember those from last time? The weakest bond, but they hold large three-dimensional structures together. So the sugar right here is different. First of all, this is different. Thiamine is in DNA, not in RNA. The sugar in DNA is deoxyribose. That's where we get the D from versus R, which would be ribose. So remember dehydration synthesis, remember all that business when you're building up, building up phosphates with sugars that's dehydration synthesis or putting chains of nucleotides together. Once you put things together, you lose a water and you're synthesizing. So that was a crazy lecture for a really long time. Okay, <clears throat> so the nitrogenous bases have a hydrogen bond between the other base. So CG, right, C to G, 
and T, A to T. I would like say A to T, T to A. But guess what? There's a little bit of a mistake here, right? This is thymine. Tyrosine is an amino acid. I shouldn't, that's not correct there. Correct. So if you saw that, so this is the way they, they bond, A, T, C, G. Remember, maybe we didn't tell you, but DNA, here's another difference between DNA and RNA. DNA is double-stranded. It has two chains, and it bonds like this all the way down. So there could be another, there could be a T that's always going to bond with A, G, always going to bond with C. And it builds up thousands and thousands of codes. And, and you know what this is all about, basically? This is, this is building amino acids. And what do amino acids build? Anybody know? Which Protein. one of them? Protein. Proteins, right. And that's what we're made of. Fatty acids. Not yet. Fatty acids are not really, that's a good question. It's not really part of our, our protein, right? It's protein or amino acids. And they're, you're going to see that they're transcribed from this basic genetic code that we get from a mom and dad and so forth, so on after that, our genes. So they form these specific bonds that build amino acids. And then you build the protein. Crazy, right? It's crazy. So this is showing one, just one DNA nucleotide, right? Here's your base, which could be A, T, C, or G. Here's your deoxyribose. And then you have the phosphate. So the sugar always bonds with the... Um, phosphate group and the sugar also bonds here with the base G T C and A so what do you think G would bond with on this side in this strand of DNA anybody know anybody remember C. yeah C All right what about T A and C again back to G and then A to T Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Remember, there's two strands of DNA. And there's going to be a new strand that's going to be synthesized once this replicates. It's a miracle. This whole machinery is just a miracle. So here's the bond between G and C. And notice these are dotted line hydrogen bonds. And they're going to take enzymes to break them. They're not that weak. They do take enzymes to break this up and then replicate one of the strands. And once it's replicated, then it can be converted to this other molecule called RNA. Crazy stuff. So remember, AT, CG, bonding along long strands of DNA. So this goes on. Like you see this? This is go. Then it, they kind of form that helix. Remember the sugar and the phosphate are along these ladder. Like if this was a spiral spiral staircase. And then here are the hydrogen bonds. They're just showing you how that bonds continue along that double helix. You've probably seen this somewhere. All right, so it's a sugar phosphate backbone. I like to call it the rings of a staircase. And then you have your base pairing with hydrogen bonds in this double-stranded DNA molecule. So RNA, what's the difference? What's the difference? The ribose is the sugar, five-carbon sugar, not de deoxyribose. It only has one strand, right? Instead of being double stranded. And it has uracil instead of thymine. So when RNA is being transcribed to DNA, you have this A here, right? So A is going to bond with the RNA U, right? C again is still G. So it's A U C G. And it's going to replicate the DNA and then leave the nucleus. So remember, RNA can leave the nucleus. It has to, because that's where it has to go out and build the proteins. And you don't have to memorize the actually, I tell you this all the time. You don't have to memorize the exact carbon rings and, and the sugar, so the five carbon sugar structure, but it's slightly different. Notice there's one less oxygen. Did you pick that up? One less oxygen. That's what they call deoxyribose. Miraculous, really. So memorize this. Now there's three types of RNA. And 
what are we doing? We're assembling proteins. And what do we need to assemble proteins? We need amino acids. There's only like 20 amino acids total. Maybe nine of them we have to get from our diet. It's amazing. So let, let's get these down. This always gets confusing. So I'm trying to keep this simple as possible. Messenger RNA is the RNA that's going to be in the nucleus that's going to replicate the DNA. It's like a copy of the strand of DNA. And messenger RNA is going to leave the nucleus of the cell, go out to the cytoplasm, which you're going to learn what that is clearly soon. So this is really the copy. This is the traveling copy. That's why it's called messenger, like a messenger guy or gal. And the transfer RNA, this, this is a really cool one. This one's in the cytoplasm and it collects amino acids to build protein based on what messenger RNA brings in from the DNA. And really all it is is base pairing over and over. It's, it's palindromic, it's redundant. It's miraculous and amazing how this happens. And really we didn't figure this out till like 1969. And back then it probably cost you a million dollars to map your DNA. Now you could probably do it for under a hundred dollars. Right, am I right about that? If anybody's ever done that? to find out what's in your genes, what are proteins are you building? And it gets more exciting than that. And there's more research to do on it. But this is what we know. That's what I'm giving to you. Then you have rRNA or ribosomal RNA. Basically, what you need to know about this is it builds ribosomes. You can't talk about protein synthesis without talking about the ribosome. So I'll tell you right now, I probably mentioned this before, but ribosomes in the cytoplasm is the site of protein synthesis. And I hope we get to this today because this is really exciting stuff. It's at the end of this cell chapter though. Okay, so what's gonna happen here? You're gonna have DNA, right, in the nucleus double-stranded, you know all that stuff now. Messenger RNA is gonna make a copy of one of those strands of DNA as it's replicating, crazy. Messenger RNA is gonna leave the nucleus, find the ribosome, which is basically um, built by the transfer, I'm sorry, by ribosomal RNA, and you're gonna see where that happens. And then transfer RNA, so I'll just put our RNA here, Transfer RNA is going to go around picking up the amino acids and bring them to the ribosome to build specific proteins that were transcribed by your DNA, coded by your DNA. Sorry about the dog barking. It's in his DNA. He bark when he sees the Amazon guy. All right. So if you get a bunch of these, or if you get 20, you can go in a polypeptide, which is the building block for protein. So the peptide bonds. So you're building proteins on the ribosome in the cytoplasm. So that's a little foreshadowing to where we're going. Okay. So these are other um, nucleic acids, really, or RNA related. Remember, we talked about adenosine triphosphate. This is guanine triphosphate because they carry energy. Uh, GTP, we're going to talk about when we do cellular metabolism throughout the mitochondria, right? When we're building energy, we're building ATP, right? Basically. And GTP is part of that process. Cyclic AMP is another one that we'll talk about when we do receptors and enzymes on cells and how that's a second messenger for things to move in and out of cells and create work. So NAD and FAD are like basically vitamin based molecules that are really important for oxidizing and reducing. And we're, we're going to get to that. So it, it's based on ribo, uh, ribose. So again, this is, I won't talk about this today until probably next lecture when we talk about cellular metabolism and energy and the electron transport chain and all of those things. Okay. 
Anybody have any questions about that? So you have a good picture of what DNA is versus RNA, don't you think? And you're kind of hearing, you're hearing amino acids, you're hearing building proteins, right? You're hearing ribosome. So you're starting to get some of this stuff that's based on what's going to go on in this cell. Anybody have any questions or anything? I have a question. I think sure. it's more so about last week, but the image just reminded me. So the dotted lines represent the hydrogen bond. Yes, yes. And then I feel like I'm confusing the double solid lines and the single solid lines. Uh -huh. so is the solid, the single solid lines, is that covalent or ionic? Oh, they're always covalent. Good question. Okay. So even the double. Yeah. Double is a double covalent bond where they're sharing two pairs of electrons. So do ionic Good bonds question. assemble or not? Not really. <laughs> not really. Not really. That's a good point. They basically have the positive and negative next to each other. So that's an ionic bond. And the only, the one we know the best is sodium chloride, right? So for our purposes, yes, single line is a single covalent bond sharing one pair of electrons, where a double uh, line is a double covalent bond, which is sharing two pairs of electrons. Very good. Like in a, in a monounsaturated fat, it builds a double bond between that carbon, carbon and the other hydrogen. Because what's the fatty acids saturated with hydrogens, right? They're saturated with hydrogen. That's a good. That's a good question. Yeah. Anybody have anything else like that before we move on? It's going to get a little easier now. We're going to go into the cell. Hi, Chris. Okay. So let's get there. Where is it? Okay. So we remember where this fits in, and basically all those things that happened before in that levels of organization of building up to a cell, right? Okay. So anatomy, we have to go through the anatomy a little bit too. We have to, we have to go through. So let's, this is all refresher, right? For people in this class. Maybe you haven't taken biology for a long time and this might seem new, which is great. It's exciting. So this is the basic functional units of the body, but really living, cells are living, metabolizing. Remember metabolism, the, the definition of metabolism is, is the sum of all, all metabolic reactions or oral reactions, chemical reactions in the body, like anabolic versus catabolic. So this stuff is going on all day long in your cells. And, you know, there's a variety of cells. You know the four tissue types, you know, um, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, connective tissue, and epithelial tissues. That's a good place to start with. Uh, different variants of shapes and sizes of cells. But within those four tissue types, there's many different varieties of cells. Trillions of cells in our body. Millions, millions of different types too. So let's talk about the parts of the cell. So the plasma membrane, and this is really exciting. You know, this is a typical cell membrane. All right, I draw this again. This is probably going to wind up in the, in the Whitney by the end of the day all my beautiful artwork. So the thing with the plasma membrane, this is not a cell wall, like in a, in a celery or in a, in a tomato cell. This is a very fluid, I like these terms, mosaic. You are people should get this, right? This is constantly moving with fluids moving in and out, fluids within it. Uh, lipids mixed with phosphate. We talked about those phospholipids, right? Well, this is where we're going to talk about it. And here's the physiology of it. It's selectively permeable. It doesn't let a lot of things in easy, right? Lipid soluble structures, or lip, I'm sorry, lipid soluble molecules can get in and out pretty easy, like oxygen, carbon dioxide. And, and that those are two gases, lipid soluble gases. And then you have this magical stuff called the water, right? H2O, we talked about that. So that has pretty much a free pass, but you'll see exactly. So yeah, it gives form to the cell, the plasma membrane, but every cell has a plasma membrane. I can't think of any, any right now that don't, maybe a platelet. And they separate the inside from the outside. That's really important. And not so much as a barrier, but in physiology. So the inner part right here, this, this circle right here, 
It's got a little dot inside. I'll tell you what that is later. That's the nucleus of the cell. And that's where the DNA lives. And then any be anything between the membrane and the nucleus is called the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm involves organelles and a fluid. And the fluid is called cytosol. So it's a cool name, cytosol. So all the fluid, we have organelles, like you have the mitochondria, you have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, you have the Golgi apparatus, you have centrosome, you have lysosome, you have um, peroxisome, and, and a few others we gotta talk about. So all of those are organelles, but the fluid part is called cytosol. And technically the nucleus is, a, is an organelle as well. And inside the nucleus, you have this, believe it or not, it's building ribosomes. It's building ribosomes it's called the nu um, nucleolus or nucleolus. So we'll see that. So what do we know about the nucleus? Here we go. DNA and there's proteins in there. <clears throat> so DNA plus proteins usually comes up to a name called chromatin. So that's protein and DNA. So that makes up that inside of the cell. And of course the cell goes through cycles, which we'll hopefully get to at the end of the day today. So there it is, my friends. There's a, your basic, it's very basic. I think this is like the Hyundai of the cell. It doesn't really have a lot of options, but it's got the main ones, which is really important. Now I couldn't call this a red blood cell. Why couldn't I call this a red blood cell? Anybody know? What's different about a red blood cell compared to other cells, especially epithelial cells? Is it because it has a nucleus? It has a nucleus and, and other organelles, like other membrane. Like the nucleus doesn't even have a mitochondria. Crazy, my favorite organelle. I'm sorry, the red blood cell doesn't have mitochondria. So it's all it does is have hemoglobin that carries oxygen without a nucleus. Very good, thank you. So let's start inside the nucleus. The nucleus has this nucleolus. And this basically is making ribosomes that are gonna make up the um, ribosome RNA that leaves the nucleus, of course, to make ribosomes outside the cell or in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, as you'll see. So right now you can't see, even if this was, I know this is a cartoon, you can't see the chromosomes, but it's not there yet. They're not dense yet they're not ready to divide so before that time it's called chromatin which i told you is dna and other proteins like histones is one of the proteins that's in the nucleus so the nucleus has its own membrane and that's called the nuclear envelope i really like this picture it's, it's basic but it tells you everything so the nuclear envelope is the membrane of the nucleus and it has openings. Can you see that? I don't know if the, the word is here. I don't know why. But the openings in the nucleus or the nuclear envelope, these are called nuclear pores. So this is how the ribosomes get out of the nucleus. This has the messenger RNA leave the nucleus through these nuclear pores. Pretty good, right? And then outside the membrane of the nucleus, you have another membranous structure organelle called the RER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then you have out here, you have this smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So what do you notice about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum versus the rough endoplasmic reticulum? It has these little dots on it, right? studded with these dots. Anybody know what these dots are? I'll tell you. These are ribosomes, yeah. Ribosome. These are ribosomes. Very good. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have ribosomes where the rough endoplasmic reticulum does. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What do you think that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is making if it has ribosomes? Protein. Protein, that's right. So those are Rough ER 
ribosomes, but there's also free ribosomes out in the cytoplasm. And the fluid in the cytoplasm is called the cytosol. Kind of makes sense, right? Then you have the Golgi apparatus, which kind of takes all these products. Like, like the, the SER, I didn't say what's made there. What do you think is made there? Nothing, they're not making proteins there. So let's make other things. Let's make phospholipids for the membrane and for vesicles. Let's make steroids, which are lipids. Let's make carbohydrates. Let's mix the two, make glycoproteins or uh, glycolipids, kind of mix them together. So the smooth end of the plasma particular is making everything except for proteins, especially the, the phospholipids. So the Golgi apparatus takes all those manufactured products like proteins, um, carbohydrates, lipids like steroids, and kind of packages them up into what are called vesicles. Like vesicles actually have membranes as well. So this is like the post office and the, the vesicles are like the, the package. I shouldn't even say post office, should be saying Amazon now, right? Post office or so 1990. So now we're taking all these products and we're building them, getting them ready to either leave the cell, which it can, like a vesicle could leave the cell. And sometimes things come into the cell and put in vesicles, sent to the Golgi apparatus to be broken down for its parts maybe, and then sent off somewhere else. So this is like a city going on here where the, the government is basically the nucleus. Nucleolus is just that little ping pong ball making ribosomes. So basically it's made of ribosomal RNA. So think ribosome, nucleolus, rRNA. It kind of helps you remember, right? Then we have centrioles, which is part of a organelle called centrosome. Centrioles are important for cellular division. Like when this cell, and this is not a sex cell, this is not a sperm or an oocyte. This is a typical somatic cell. Let's call it that, somatic cell. Anything that's not a gamete, which is a sperm or egg. So if when this cell divides, which you know most cells do, not every cell divides a lot, and you're gonna find that out. Centrioles are important to keep the integrity of the cell as the chromosomes are splitting from one side to the other. So what do we call somatic cell division? Anybody know it begins with an M, ends in an osis? It's a trick question a little bit. Mitosis. Yeah, mitosis, not meiosis. Mitosis is a nuclear somatic cell division where the nucleus is actually going to separate, the chromosomes are going to separate and get two exact same cells. So the centrioles are basically protein spindles, which you'll see that hold the cell together as that's happening. So hopefully we'll get to that today. So cell, uh, cell division through mitosis, maybe even meiosis, who knows? Meiosis is gamete cell division of the sperm or the egg completely different outcome. Like mitosis, exactly the same cell. Genetically, everything's the same. Two cells, just, they call them daughter cells. In meiosis with sperm and egg cell, completely different genetic cells. And usually get four at the end of two meiosis. So it's important for them, you know, this is a somatic cell, not a, a gamete. And you see these microtubules kind of, and they, they kind of give structure to the inside of the cell. These are protein, microtubules are proteins. These are really important actually, you know, kind of bypass this. Well, it's just a protein just for shape. And, but if this is a brain cell and you have a problem in the machinery that makes this protein microtubule, you can, you can develop something like tangles and plaques and build up a protein. And that's how something like Alzheimer's happens. These microtubular proteins get these neurofibrillary tangles because of the way they're produced, which could be genetic, or there could be destruction to this support system of proteins in a brain cell. Like this is not a brain cell. Uh, it could be the brain cell has a lot of these parts, doesn't have so much centriole because the brain cells don't really undergo mitosis that much. I think I mentioned when we talked about tissue that the most mitotic tissue is epithelial tissue. The least is probably probably brain tissue or nervous tissue. And, and cardiac muscle is not so great either when it comes to regenerating through mitosis. 
So I can't forget about the mitochondria, right? Mitochondrion is one. Um, mitochondrion, that mitochondria is plural. Here's another one. And this is a double membraned organelle, which you'll see. So then the plasma membrane, that fluid mosaic model, selectively permeable with a biphospholipid layer. So it's both sides have the phospholipid. Phospholipid faces in and out. The, I'm sorry, the phosphate faces in and out. And the lipid is the middle of the membrane. You're gonna see that in great abundance. So here, here's a nice little table that shows you, pretty much talks about all the things, you know, the cell membrane structure and function. And you should know what it looks like, the cytoplasms in between the nucleus and the membrane, the ER rough and smooth ribosomes, Golgi complex, also known as the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria. I like talking about lysosomes because these basically are really high in white blood cells. So they call this the suicide sacs, the membranous sacs that contain enzymes that kind of destroy things. So if a white blood cell engulfs something like a bacteria or a virus, cancer, then the lysosome tries to destroy it. Really good. Peroxisomes are more about detoxifying. Like the liver has a lot of um, peroxisome. Centrosome is about spindles and mitosis, right? Vacuoles. Okay, this is pretty much about getting rid of proteins. We're not going to talk a lot about vacuoles. These are the important ones. I mentioned this with brain cells and Alzheimer's, the protein microtubules. And they're tubules because they're hollow, like straws, like beaded straws. Microfilaments are small parts, smaller than microtubules. We're going to talk a little about these two, cilia and flagella, which are also proteins that are on the outside of the membrane all the time. Nuclear envelope is the nuclear membrane, nucleolus. Again, produces the ribosomal RNA that builds ribosomes, really. And uh, chromatin is protein plus the DNA. So this is a really good um, table to review. So it looks like this exam is going to be pretty straightforward. Like I don't know how much we're going to get done today, but let's get to it. So the structure of the plasma membrane. And again, I could talk about this for six hours. So just to get an idea of what we're talking about with transport, what happens at the membrane. Remember, it's a biphospholipid layer. And so the outside phosphate, Right. And this goes on and on. I think I drew this last time. So you have to know the compartments. Like this, say, this is the cytosol. I know I might have done this before. And everything outside the cell is ECF, extracellular fluid, also known as interstitial fluid. So this membrane is mostly lipid tails, which are nonpolar. The phosphate heads are polar. The phosphates are hydrophilic. The tails are hydrophobic. So it makes it <clears throat> kind of complicated to get things in and out. That's why it's selectively permeable. So really important. And that's this whole hydrophobic center with more of a hydrophilic phosphate outer and inner. So it's selective on what it allows to pass through. So Pretty much, if you have a protein that needs to get in here, it's going to need a protein carrier or channel, which you're going to see. Yeah, that picture is not going to make it to the um, to the museum. So phospholipids, not trapped in the membrane, they kind of, I mean, they move around. That's just, and I mentioned this fluid mosaic model. I got to get to the picture here. I can't keep drawing this. It just doesn't make sense. So this is a pretty good drawing I got here. So here's the extracellular side, which is an ocean of sodium. I hope I got that to you. I hope you really understand that that's an ocean of sodium, you know, and positively charged most of the time. I hope I got that through to you guys. The inside where it says intracellular, intra means within, inter means um, between. 
So the intracellular side, intracellular side is the cytosol, really. And I might have said that this is normally more negatively charged in like a, a muscle cell or a nerve cell, because you know we're going to talk a lot of it about that. And it's more positive on the outside because of all the sodium. So what's in this membrane? And you can see the phosphate heads. And then you see all these attachments, like right here. This, these are all proteins. Protein, protein. Some of them are transmembrane proteins, which will go through. Some of them have carbohydrate attached to them. Some of them don't have anything attached to them. They're called peripheral proteins. So glycoproteins contain both. Pro, uh, lipid, I'm sorry, they contain protein and carbohydrate, which it makes it very sticky on the outside of a cell, like glycocalyx, they call it. But we're not gonna really talk a lot about that. I think we need to talk about these proteins. This is really important. So some proteins could be channels. So you can have channel proteins, you can have carrier proteins. And some could be enzymes. And some could be receptors. Because something like oxygen, that's going to diffuse right in. That's, that's easy, simple diffusion. But if you get something like a neurotransmitter or, uh, or insulin, a hormone, sometimes it has to bind to that receptor to allow glucose to get into the cell. So insulin will bind to a receptor, which will open up a channel carrier, which could be both, and the glucose is kind of large. So the glucose will be carried in, even if it's going down its gradient. So the proteins help those hydrophilic substances, those polar substances like glucose. You can't get anything that's more polar than that except for water. But also proteins are polar. So insulin is a protein. So that means a receptor to do its job. Testosterone is a lipid. So that's gonna get in a lot easier and get right to the nucleus. So definitely know the phospholipid set up here. What's the polar end? What's the nonpolar end? And I might have mentioned this within the cell membrane is cholesterol. This is normal. This is where it should be. So cholesterol gives strength to this cellular, also known as plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane, cell membrane, selectively permeable by phospholipid layer and fluid mosaic model. So these proteins are always changing. So remember, proteins have to be transcribed from DNA. So that whole machinery of building proteins could involve receptors, channels, enzymes, like enzymes that need to break down ATP to get energy to move things across the membrane. Like I mentioned, the sodium potassium ATPase pump in the chemistry. And glycolipids, these are more identifications. We're not gonna, again, we're not gonna talk a lot about these carbohydrate mixed with lipids on the outside. We live in this area with the proteins mixed into this biphospholipid layer model. So the membrane proteins, structure, right? Okay, transport, those are your channels. And these are channels for polar substances or carriers, it's a miracle really. Enzymes or receptors, the self markers, and I guess this is kind of important, um, not well understood. So the self markers are, are usually the glycoproteins. So this gives you what's called a, I just call it MHC, which is major histocompatibility complex. So major means major, not like major in the army, pretty big deal. Um, histology means, or histocompatibility, histo means tissue. Compatibility means, um, does the tissue match? So really for us, the only important thing about this major histocompatibility complex and these markers on the outside of these cells is if you were going to get a tissue transplant. 
because your your cells have this glycoprotein calyx they call it. it's like the out, outer part of it that is specific for you like a fingerprint like your dna chains it's not exactly the same but it does give you or gives your tissue a sense of self so if you receive a kidney from someone or you receive a heart transplant or any tissue from somebody who's not your identical twin or yourself, your chances are your body will reject that tissue. You kind of understand that? That's kind of a, a kind of a, a topic that that's, we're going to lead into. So hi, yeah, yeah. How you doing? So is it? What's up, Professor? Can I ask a question? Is that kind of like when you uh, does that? Is that involved when you transfer blood? Not so much. No. It's different. Good question. But it, uh, the blood typing has to do with the surface of the red blood cell membrane. That's a good question, but it's different. That, that's a really good question. It's different. I mean, they're both an autoimmune response. You know what autoimmune means? It's, um, well, I shouldn't say autoimmune because it's, you're getting a transfusion with blood typing too. But autoimmune means like you, your body, your immune system picks up your own tissue as being foreign. It's a bad situation, you know, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis and terrible things like that. But I'm not really talking about autoimmune. I'm talking about um, tissue transplant, incompatibility. So your immune system is going to, you know, cite an attack if you get a heart transplant on that new heart. Unless you get, even, even if it is your identical twin, which is, would be a great thing, but imagine how horrible that would be. Um, good in one way, but horrible in another. But just having a different tissue put into your body, it's going to cite a response and your body's going to reject it, right? You've heard that. We all watch. Uh, I don't, actually, I don't watch Grey's Anatomy, but a lot of people do. So they have a tissue rejection. Um, and then you'd have to be put on, you know, anti-immune medications, right? Steroids like cortisone to stop the major inflammation product for the rest of your life, right? Well, so this... The meds are also given because I used to deal with uh, transplants of the cornea of the ah. eye. And so the, the first thing we always ask is what's the cause of death? So it depends on what this person that we take the transplant from and implant it into another patient. Yeah. What exactly that person died off and how his history was if he has had hiv then obviously yeah. it's not a good yeah. point <laughs> but i'm not even talking about that I'm, I'm talking about just if you've got a perfectly healthy tissue right right like just a motorcycle accident because... yeah 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 so I, I hate to say this but if you do drive a motorcycle without your helmet on maybe you should be an organ donor yeah. <laughs> she liked that one. That's good. I feel better. I feel better. <laughs> now, I used to ride a motorcycle too. Nothing against it. Okay. So I just want to bring that up with this major histocompatibility complex. Cause like Katrin was saying, it's really important when you're getting a, a, a transplant that that tissue matches as, as much as possible. So I think that's all I want to talk about that for now as far as the cell. That's why I wanted to stop for a minute. So there's carbohydrates, here's your glycolipids and glycoproteins. And this, Christopher, uh, antigens are on your red blood cell. Like if you're um, type A blood, then you have the A antigen and you definitely don't have the anti-A antibodies. If, you, if you're type AB blood, you have both A and B antigen on your red blood cells. And I don't even know why they're there. I honestly have no reason, I have no answer for that, why we have those, it, those actual antigens on our blood cells. Antigen means, I might've mentioned this before, means antibody generator. So it's something that your body picks up as foreign and your antibodies or your defense are gonna attack it and clump with it and bind to it and try to destroy it. So for some reason we have these antigens, AB antigens on our blood cells. And then there's the, um, the RH factor as well, which is another antigen. So you can be A, AB, or AB positive, B positive, A positive. O doesn't have any antigens. Probably why the O blood type is the universal donor. So you can't destroy it if you get it. 
that's really but I, I, again that's it's a little different now with, with when, when i'm talking about with the histocompatibility complex it's two different things which is a great question so cholesterol gives it a nice pliability and strength so cholesterol is important in your cell membranes like remember when when, when they came out with all the anti uh, probably i'm probably the only one that remembers when they came out with these statins right that uh, stopped the enzyme that um synthesizes cholesterol in your body they're called statins and people were abusing them or the doctors were over prescribing them maybe i mean of course we want to keep your overall cholesterol low and your your ldls low but if you take if you drive the cholesterol down too much it's going to affect your membranes and it did it caused pain and heart attacks uh, excessive um dosages of those statin drugs so we still have them and, and again they're, they're not abused and it's more under control but but the point is this you need the cholesterol and cholesterol is the basis for all what for all steroids steroids yeah including you know your vitamin d your testosterone your estrogen your progesterone aldosterone cortisol really important cholesterol in homeostatic levels, of course. Okay, phagocytosis. This is a this is a real cool immune thing now. This is another important thing. So remember those little vesicles? Let's go back to that picture. It was kind of showing it. it made me think of phagocytosis, like right up top here. And this again, this cell is it, it's it's what did I say it was a Hyundai? Nothing against Hyundai. It just, you know, like it used to be like a real stripped down car. Now it's beautiful actually, but like this cell has almost all the options, but not all of them. So some cells have this ability to engulf like, like a white blood cell, like a, a T lymphocyte, let's say. And, and you see that COVID-19, you know, flying around in there. And then all of a sudden the cell will engulf that and bring it in. And then remember the lysosome, the suicide sac will bind with that and try to destroy it. So that engulfing, that eating is called phagocytosis. So the cell is engulfing something. And that's a really important process. Like, again, did you ever play that game Pac-Man? Did you ever hear that? Pac-Man, am I really old? Or they still have that. You know, it looks like the, the big thing with the mouth and he's eating all the little things, right? So that is kind of the way it works with white blood cells and phagocytosis it's bringing in so they call that it's got to be here somewhere it's called endocytosis endo to bring in cytosis within the cell you can speak out chris you have a question yeah um the um have you ever heard of autophagy say it again autophagy sounds familiar it's like when the body kind of like eats its cells, like the old like cells. A condition or just the process? What do you mean? What'd you say? I'm sorry. The, is what? that like a condition you're asking or is it like more of a... No, no. It's a process that they say your body goes into. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like an autoimmune situation. Sort of. Yeah. It takes the... Yeah. It's kind of like what it's saying here. It takes the, the mouth, the, the dead or deformed cells and it kind of just eats it and then creates... Well, that's them. normal. That's, that's the way all the, the proteasomes work and the vacuoles, they work that way through... Okay. that particular function yeah yeah so that's the same thing here it's kind of like it is thing. it is okay yeah that, and that's what the word phage means to engulf yeah. makes sense right mm -hmm. so these guys you see this word this word i use a lot because these are cells in your tissue big the big eaters all right especially bacteria but anything really anything that's foreign neutrophils are a type of white blood cell so these are the little eaters. So neutrophils are one of the five white blood cells that you may learn. And neutrophils are really explicit in bacterial infections. Like if you have a uh, urinary tract infection, you're going to get excessive release and production of neutrophils. They call them polymorphonuclear cells. And they'll see that on histology. They could see it in sometimes in a urinalysis. But neutrophils are from the blood. Macrophages are in the tissue. They're kind of resident cells in our tissue. Like if you get cut, 
they're right on the job. They're like the first line of the def- second line of defense. Your skin is your first line of defense. The macrophages in the tissue are your second line of defense. And then the blood cells are your third line of defense, technically. Okay. So these pseudopods are extensions of the cell, those, the cell membrane actually that kind of extends into the extracellular fluid and brings things in. So again, proteins called integrins with extracellular proteins. So that helps bringing in and bonding with whatever is an antigen and bringing it into the cell. So they engulf and other organic materials and they form this vacuole, which is usually like a garbage can. I I should have said that back with the cell. They're kind of like a garbage can, the vacuoles. And that fuses with the suicide sac, which has all the enzymes. And enzymes digest things like digestive enzymes anyway, and lysosomal enzymes, which are called lysosyme. Lyso, isozyme will destroy it. So the vacuum and the lysosome are basically look like vesicles, little spaceships that join after the endocytosis or phagocytosis. Of course, it's important for body defense. Now, here's two words that are thrown in here, but these two words are very important. I mentioned inflammation. Inflammation is a completely appropriate release of macrophages and and other immune cells. So inflammation is good when you need it, right? Inflammation, you get stung by a bee, you have to bring in inflammatory cells. You get cut, you need inflammatory cells. If you eat something that has too many um, free radicals, you have to, you get inflammation, right? So, I mean, it's it's completely appropriate. The problem with inflammation is it, it, it never stops or sometimes it doesn't stop, there's excess inflammation, too many macrophages in, in, in the linings of your blood vessels, in your heart. So inflammation in your brain. So inflammation, this over, maybe an overimmune response. You're picking this up now, you kind of understand that it could be autoimmune, that could be overimmune, and that could be underimmune. This is a, a homeostasis. I don't think we figured out yet. You got to kind of agree. We're talking about, you know, um, autoimmune conditions, talking about immunosuppressed conditions, like Kat mentioned, uh, AIDS or HIV, which lowers your your immune system, ultimately destroys your immune system. And you need a balance with that. But inflammation is something normal, right? Like anybody ever take an Advil in here? It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It's great. It works great. And, um, And that usually makes you feel better. If you have like osteoarthritis, worn out joints, inflammatory joints, you're gonna feel better. Again, but you can't live on any medication like that. You can't take that every day for the rest of your life, especially in those dosages of 200 milligrams, whatever it is. So inflammation is a big part of your cell physiology that, that sometimes can cause more problems. And it does, and it does like dementia, for example, for instance. Too much inflammation around those synapses in your brain can lead to um, lack of connection, especially to your memory areas in your brain, like your hippocampus or your temporal parietal lobes. So inflammation, yeah, that's a, that's one we got to talk about. It's good and it's appropriate, right? Then you have this word called apoptosis. That's a cool word to say, isn't it, Catherine? Isn't that a good word to say? Apoptosis. That's like a programmed. cell death. So a cell with a nucleus, like um, any cell besides the red blood cell, the red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus, therefore it cannot undergo mitosis. It can't divide. So once the red blood cell is made, it's got like four months to cruise around, maybe collect a little glucose, you get your A1C done with a red blood cell, and then it just, it gets broken down for its parts. And it basically goes through apoptosis. But even cells that are, are undergoing mitosis, you got to figure, well, if I had, if, if, I, if I'm a cell and I make a copy of myself, what's going to happen to me in, in like however long? 
I'm going to get old, right? My DNA is going to get um, a little bit worn out. You kind of understand what I mean? Like the cell, it, it doesn't really um, become a new cell. It, like, 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 again, I, you guys are, I'm just so old. But remember, remember like a videotape, you know, like, like a cassette tape? Chris, you know what I'm talking about, right? You put it, you know, and then if you make a t- copy of that tape, it's not so great. And then the copy of that tape is, you know, I'm being a little dramatic, but so every time your DNA is copied, you have these things called telomeres. I got some good metaphors. Listen to this one. A telomere is like, you know, that little plastic thing at the end of your shoelaces. That's kind of like that. It's the end of a chromosome, which we'll hopefully get to today. I keep talking too much. So the, that telomere actually gets worn out over time. So every time the DNA replicates, the telomere gets a little shorter, which may sound like the key to life, but I'm not sure. It could be. Let us know, like an aglet. Let me know, Angeline, if you find out that's the key to life. Like an aglet. That's what that's called? I got to write that down. That's what the shoelace thing is called, right? That's cool. I remember that for Jeopardy later. So um, the, the cell becomes maybe less functional. And, and maybe maybe there's a way to, to stop that from happening. All right? Through these gene splicing, which I don't know if I'll get to that today. But we're going to learn about the cell. I mean, we can't go on not learning about the cell. So apoptosis, these are really big, two big things that were mentioned here. Apoptosis and inflammation in this class. So if you walk out knowing something like that, that's pretty cool. Look at this little scanning electron microscope of microscopy on a phagocytosis. Looks like some bacteria in there. Maybe some strep going in to be destroyed by the lysosome. And that garbage pail we call the vacuole. So that's endocytosis. I don't know if that word showed up. Endocytosis. Because there's going to be an exocytosis, especially in the nervous system, where the cell stores something and it, and it spits it out, in a, in a, out of a vesicle. It's like the opposite of endocytosis. Yeah, there it is. Endocytosis. And that's really what phagocytosis is. So pinocytosis is basically a nonspecific, it's like cell drinking, like takes in a lot of um, particles. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about that because that's, it's pretty much the same business as usual for a cell to be doing that with different molecules, maybe different ions, but mostly molecules. So specific endocytosis, the, the receptor, and it's a protein receptor, that will bind to something that's brought in, like a T cell, a helper T cell, right? Helper T cell is very specific for not really AIDS, AIDS is the syndrome, but for HIV, right? Human immunosuppressive virus. So when your T cell sees that and the HIV sees that, they, they make a perfect match actually. But the, the scary thing about COVID or and HIV at its time is that that virus will masquerade within that T cell and it'll look normal. And it'll just it, like all of a sudden you got this great immune response. And then maybe could be years later, it destroys your immune system, especially HIV. And it really would, it hijacks your, your RNA, right? And, and spits its own RNA back into your cells and they undergo mitosis viruses don't even they're not even living things they're they're like parasitic they kind of live off of our cells and they're really smart at it. virus and viruses can be appropriate at times but not these not COVID 19 which you know again hijacks your immune system and masquerades as your immune cells and takes over in the worst case scenario so that's important to know how it works through endocytosis. Cholesterol has these things called uh, lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. LDLs, everybody know what LDLs are? Cholesterol is kind of important too. Density lipids? Yeah, they're low density lipoproteins. So they're low density because they have more cholesterol in them than they do protein. So high density have more protein in them. So it's better. The high density is better because it's carrying the protein back to the liver. I'm sorry, carrying the cholesterol back to the liver where it it can go to the membrane, right? Or make steroids. 
and do its job. But low density lipoproteins have low protein in them, high fat, high cholesterol. And usually that's gonna hang around in your blood. And when you have a lot of LDLs, what's that cell that, that's like I said, was like a second line of defense that's gonna to try to engulf and destroy? Which one was that? The big eater, which was the big eater? The white blood cell. The other one. It's a, it's a derivative white blood, not a neutrophil, but what's the other one? Macrophage. The macrophage, yeah, you guys are getting it now. So, the, the, so what happens is macrophages are released in the presence of LDL because they, they see that there's, something's not right with LDL. It's too much cholesterol in your blood. So what did I say happens when the excess macrophages are released? Inflammation, right? And inflammation is going to build up in your blood vessels and in your heart, and it's going to destroy the lining of your blood vessels. And you're going to get things like atherosclerosis. And ultimately, that can cause a blood clot, a thrombosis, or it can cause an occlusion of blood flow to your heart or, or your brain or your lungs. So inflammation could be ex, ex, exacerbated by excess LDLs. You can understand that? And it's all the immune part that's completely appropriate. But again, it can cause things like cardiovascular disease. Hepatitis virus, same thing. You're white blood cells, try to destroy that foreign antigen. This is pretty cool. You see the vesicles inside and kind of pouches inward full, forms that pseudopod. So if you have that antigen right there, whatever it is, it could suck it in, phagocytize it, bring it in, and then you get your lysosome to help break it up. So the vesicles within could have anything in them. They could have antigens in them. They could have neurotransmitters. It depends on what's going on at what time. Because we didn't talk about exocytosis. That's going to be a big one in um, on this right here. It's going to be a big one when we do um, nervous system. So something like, um, anybody know what any neurotransmitters? Like what's the one in the brain for depression? Serotonin. Yeah, like serotonin. which is really based on amino acids, tyrosine. And this is stored in your, um, the ends of your neurons, like within the cell. So these are stored in vesicles. So when they're released, they, they're released outside the cell to the next cell. So that's exocytosis. So the, the serotonin would spill out or the acetylcholine, you're gonna hear a word name. A neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, very important, or norepinephrine, or dopamine. All those are other types of neurotransmitters that are released through the process of exocytosis. Completely appropriate, and that's what we want. So we'll talk about that a lot when we get to the nervous system, the brain especially. So cilia and flagella. Flagella, you just got to talk about one thing. These are proteins... Flagella is used for swimming. It's a tail, basically. And there's only one cell in our body that's part of our body, not like a bacteria. But what cell in our body has a swim, a swimmer? It's got a tail that moves. Not everybody's body, by the way. Sperm? Sperm, yeah. Only somebody who has testes, right? made in the testes, along with the testosterone. Sperm is the only thing that has a tail in our body that we're going to talk about. Cilia is a whole different world. We have a plenty of cilia. On the, and these are on the surface of the cell, outside of the cell. So cilia, proteins, right? Microtubules are proteins. And they're outside the plasma membrane. And again, this 9 to 0, you're not going to really have to memorize that, but it's like how many um, units are in this tubule in a circular fashion. So cilia, this is important. Cilia is for movement of substances, not the cell. So cilia beat and they're motile. So in the respiratory tract, they're going to move things like mucus or antigens like COVID-19 or dust, you know, either up or down to get out of the respiratory tract. 
in the uterine tubes, we have cilia on those epithelial cells and they're both, and usually it is always epithelial tissue cells that have cilia. So the uterine tube, it would help move the oocyte down to the perfect spot in the fallopian tube in the, near the ampulla where, again, on a Friday night, the sperm can use its flagella and meet the egg and form little new person, right? All right, so motile cilia, a little different arrangement, different type of movement, non-motile. Again, they're not moving, they have other functions. And that's really in special senses, like um, like your ear, right? Everybody kind of know the ear, inside of the ear, like, you know, you know, you, know, you ever hear, I always like to make something a little, a little relative, but you ever hear vertigo? Like where you, you feel uh, lightheaded, you know, you feel like you may fall down and it has nothing to do with your blood pressure. So there's little hair cells in your ears, in your cochlea, which is the hearing organ in your inner ear that has receptors of cilia and it's for, it, it, it's for hearing, right? And in the vestibule right next to the cochlea, you have mo like cilia that's for equilibrium, like balance, right? Because and not just balance when you're on a balance beam, but keeps you upright, keeps you from being dizzy and falling over. So sometimes those hair cells that get either, there's a stone stuck in there, an autolith stuck in there, and it kind of throws off your balance when you're in your ear. And those, that kind of cilia is more about a receptor, picks up movement, right? Because there's a vestibular sense is movement, balance, equilibrium, and hearing as well uses cilia through vibration. So cilia not only move substances, the motile cilia move substances, whereas the non-motile cilia move the, um, or act as receptors. And that's what that means. So when we get to respiratory, we'll talk a lot about cilia and reproductive. We got a lot to do in this, this class. Okay. And this is just talking about the bottom of the cilia, not that important. I'm not going to go that deep into cilia now. But this cool picture, cilia, you can barely see it. It's on the outside of these cells. And it looks like little hairs or brush. There's also another one. Let me just see if it's coming up on the next slide. Yeah, microvilli. So you need to know the difference between flagella, cilia, and, another, and this, again, this is the um, tail of the sperm. It's more for um, locomotion as opposed to motility, moving things within a lumen or a tube. Lumen is the space in the tube. So I think I mentioned this. This is true, except the bacteria have a lot of the flagella, those tiny little microbiomes. But in our body, in the human, sperm is the only cell. Now we have to know the difference between cilia and flagella and microvilli. Microvilli are more for absorption. So this would be like in your small intestine, you have microvilli that form like a brush border, right? Brush border that absorbs things like calcium, uh, amino acids, vitamin D. I, haven't, I didn't mention where we're eating today. We're not talking a lot about um, micromolecules, but again, when, when you go to um, Popeye's, you know, you're going to get the amino acids that were broken down from the protein in the stomach. The protein initially is broken down in the stomach. The carbohydrate, carbohydrate is broken down in your mouth. And it further gets broken down until it gets to the small intestine where now those nutrients can be absorbed in their smallest form. Like the carbohydrates, the smallest form should be glucose. For proteins, the smallest form should be amino acids. For lipids, like triglycerides, the smallest form should be fatty acids, and they're all absorbed, along with vitamins as well. Vitamins a little more in the large intestine. So yeah, so this is for surface area, which increases the absorption rate, speed and the amount. So you increase surface area by these projections on the outside of the epithelial tissue that lines the intestinal tract. So of course, it allows for rapid diffusion as long as that gradient is high, diffusion is going from high concentration to low concentration. So the intestines are a great example, small and large. Kidney tubules, these are very complicated, but this is about either 
are we going to reabsorb this hydrogen, this glucose, this water, or are we going to just pee it out into the public sewer systems of Popeyes? So kidneys are very important in filtering what's in the blood and either reabsorbing it back into the blood or letting it be excreted out of the body. Yeah. So these are microvilli, most likely in the large intestine. The lumen is the space. Like this is where, where the Popeye's chicken's coming down, right? And of course, by this time, it's just, it's just amino acids. And so the amino acids can get absorbed in these really long, large surface areas, small cells, but I mean, small projections, but they're very large surface area, a lot of room for absorption. So that's where it's absorbed back into the blood, ultimately, you know, when the blood is involved in this connective tissue. Yeah. So let's go through a couple before we take a break. Let's go through um, some of the organelles and the cytoplasm. Again, this goes back to like high school um, biology, I think. So again, the fluid is called a cytosol. Remember, that's the same as the intracellular fluid. Cytoskeleton are those microtubule proteins. And inclusions are other things, usually proteins, inclusions. Not the um, ribosomes, but technically ribosomes are, um, is an organelle. Inclusions like glycogen. Did I mention glycogen? I'm sure I mentioned glycogen is a storage form of glucose in places like muscle. Muscle stores a lot of glycogen. So there's the a lot of glycogen. Yeah, the liver is, is the, probably the biggest place, but we need it in our skeletal muscle. Melanin granules, these are pigment granules that could be within certain cells. Not just skin, of course, not just your hair and nails, but melanin is in your eyes to prevent excess scattered light. So wherever we need it, some places we have it, we don't even know why. So it could be a more function of melanin as a pigment other than to prevent cancer, right? And there could be some fatty acids, triglycerides also, the inclusions in the cell. So that's within the cytoplasm which is between the nuclear membrane and the plasma membrane. So these are microtubules. Microfilaments are smaller um, strands of amino acids, which are proteins. And the microfilaments, when we do muscle, you're really gonna see how important those actin and myosin microfilaments are. And as far as muscle contraction, so they get a different function in different cells. So it depends on what cell we're talking about or what tissue we're talking about, because you really you memorize the tissue, so it's easier to talk about that now. And they're mobile, so they move around the cell. So the cell is not static. It's, it's changing shape, generally. But it maintains its integrity for whatever shape it, it needs to have. Remember that uh, physiology mirrors the anatomy. So the function mirrors the structure that it's given, genetically, especially with proteins, because you remember Proteins are all about structure. We don't use them for energy. We don't want to. Okay. And they organize the extracellular environment, of course. Movement of muscle cells like actin and myosin. Very protein oriented. Like in Popeye's, it's the, it's the breast meat and the thigh meat and the wing meat, even though those chickens don't fly. So, so their breasts are probably tender, but their thighs are a little bit, have more blood. Do you ever realize that? Here's an here's a important physiological thing at Popeye's. Yeah, yeah, you with me? Do you ever notice, do you ever hear white meat versus dark meat? Right, right. So, so which is the dark meat, the, the breast or the thigh? White meat. Thigh. It is, that's true, right? Because the chicken, again, doesn't fly. They walk around. And we're not really eating those fingers. They're fingers when we have chicken fingers, right? That's just, they just that's a made up term. So why is, anybody know why that the thigh is dark meat and the breast meat is white? The muscle fiber types. It could be the muscle fiber types. So you have darker fibers. You have more uh, slow twitch fibers, which contain more what? What do you think you need for more like, for running a marathon, like just in case the chicken wants to run a marathon before he goes to Popeye. They're a high endurance, um, low high intensity. High endurance, fibers. yes. 
So what do they need? What organelle do you think they need a lot of? And it's red. No. What? What is it, Claire? I was thinking like um, when I'm thinking of dark meat, isn't it more like fatty based and like more vascular? It's more vascular, she said. Did you hear that? That's true. And, but it has more mitochondria too. Mitochondria is red. So that the more mitochondria you have in, this, in the slow fibers, like in, in your thighs, in our thighs too, not just uh, the, my, our friend, the chicken, they have more mitochondria. Therefore, they're darker and less fatigable. So they're more, less exhaustible, more for aerobic uh, movement. So there's more mitochondria. So that's a really important fact when we're talking about muscle metabolism, and in this case, muscle fiber types, right? What does this have to do with Popeyes? Oh yeah, because you can see the difference between a um, breast meat and thigh meat uh, in the color. And vascularity was the best word. I like that the best, because that, that, that really shows you, this, shows you there's more blood supply. In fact, in, the, in muscles like that, they store oxygen. There's a, something called myoglobin, which is stored oxygen. It's a protein that stores oxygen. That's crazy. Just in case the chicken has to run away when the Popeye's guy's coming. But we have the same basic muscle types. Crazy. Okay. Uh, again, more about mitosis. The, the site that centrioles this is talking about centrioles forms a spindle which are proteins that keeps the integrity of the cell as it's dividing and you'll see good pictures of that hopefully today we'll get to that and a railway system so again hopefully we'll see a good picture of this those microtubules they're tubes so the ions can flow within those microtubules to go to different parts of the cell maybe even leave the cell yeah, and here's myosin. This is myosin is actually a contractile protein, which we'll talk about later. You don't have to worry about kinesins and thionins now. What do we have next? The cytoskeleton showing you, again, great picture here, because you could see, and, and the electron micrograph is a great one too, because you could see the cytoskeleton of a cell. Here's our friend, the mitochondria. And this is kind of like a lattice, like a structural network of tubules that are proteins. Really, a lot of these are under research. So really, what, what else they can do and how they're, they're made by the DNA. This really shows the plasma membrane good. It should have, you know, the proteins in, involved there. And here's the rough ER, right, which has ribosomes that are building these specific proteins. So genetics is really important. What genes you have or if there's a mutation in a gene what problems could it cause and they're happening all the time what are we, we've been sitting here for like an hour and a half almost and we have mutations going on all the time but our our cells find a way through phagocytosis to stop that mutation destroy that faulty protein and send it on its way and gets broken down for its parts and gets back to the cytoplasm and the transfer RNA will bring it back and hopefully build the correct protein. So certain things could turn on a gene or turn off a gene to build the protein correctly. And we'll talk about that hopefully today. Lysosome, what did I call this? The suicide sac right, of the cell. That's a terrible name, but it kind of makes sense. Right? It's within an immune cell and, it, it, and when the cell engulfs, the lysosome has an enzyme that usually has, and sometimes has HCL, hydrochloric acid that's gonna destroy whatever's in there. That's the primary lysosome. And then it goes on, you don't have to worry about secondary lysosome, just know what a lysosome does. And of course the lysosome has to be expelled, kind of like in an airplane, right? When they throw out the waste out of the airplane, who knows where that goes. But in our body, we can reabsorb it or destroy it and, and excrete it once it gets into the ECF and back into the blood and out through the kidney or the small or large intestine. Yeah. There you go, Chris. All right, digesting worn out or damaged organelles. And it really, like some DNA too are involved that we just don't use that has to be destroyed. So this is kind of a normal, like a spring cleaning every day that your cells do through autophagy, right? 
that's kind of that's really important and that's what's happening right now that's what i'm saying when we're sitting here we have bad cells being produced our bone marrow is making tons of red white platelets blood cells we're making proteins all the time and sometimes they aren't good sometimes they're damaged sometimes they're mutated so we have that defense built in all the time that's okay. just out of curiosity is mm -hmm. if you do like you were talking about inflammation before and things that happen to the body that we can cause to be like overdone mm -hmm. can that be kind of like hindered if we do something like that like we have over inflammation we're constantly inflaming like like something in like our our lifestyle you mean yeah yeah Any, oh, absolutely you know? absolutely i mean your diet is a good example right your diet there, and this is all true. I know you hear about superfoods. There's a lot of trends, but a lot of it makes sense because any, anything that causes inflammation is going to enhance the inflammatory process, which is not good unless you're sick, of course, and you need inflammatory cells like excess macrophages. But yeah, something, you know, your, your brain, um, something, stress, right, can cause excess inflammation. There's good and bad bacteria, right, in your system. The bad bacteria could enhance the inflammatory um, process. So the, the microbiota in your body, which are hundreds of thousands of bacteria that are really helping us, maybe only about 1,400 of them are, are cause sickness. So there's a balance of that. And if you're destroying the bacteria through taking antibiotics, like maybe you abuse something, too much of one medication, um, and then back to diet, exercise, stress, uh, sleep, all these things could actually affect the expression of these genes, which are making proteins and building inflammation sometimes. Does that make sense? And then, and then it also, because the body is constantly going into inflammation, it can affect these processes too, right? Like That's it, right. We focus on that as much. That's right. And that, and that would create a problem with homeostasis but your, your body's resilient right your body's resilient it could, it could deal with it and the more i guess i guess it sounds trite but the more natural you could be um the better homeostasis you'll have unless unless you do get sick and there's something you can't do about it so apoptosis is a programmed cell death so when the cell is dying the lysosome will take care of it right Decomposition, like that's a little, that's a little extreme, but decomposition is done by lysosomes and other bacteria, actually. So hopefully in this class, we'll get to talk about um, good bacteria versus bad bacteria, microbiota. It comes up a lot though in physiology. So we, we need to talk about with new research. Peroxisomes is more about um, detoxifying. And that's usually something that's um, not supposed to be there, like an Advil or a Tylenol, especially Tylenol, because your liver has to deal with that. Alcohol, whether it's in, in, in taking in and out, drinking, you know, ethanol, um, alcohol, or alcohol that's produced from metabolic reactions. So the peroxisomes, again, again, they're working right now. Even though we, we only had a quarter of Jack Daniels before we started this class, but still, they're still working for other metabolic reactions, which involve... Um, these functional groups like alcohol and, and they convert it into what's called hydrogen peroxide. And again, your kidney has to deal with this now after the liver has done its job. So enzymes involved in all this. So we'll go through some specific enzymes. I know we talked about them just being proteins and lowering the energy of activation from the last class. So enzymes are always important. And the mitochondria, of course, this is where aerobic cellular respiration happens. So what does that mean, cell respiration? And there's anaerobic, so that means we're not using oxygen. In this case, we're using oxygen and we're making a lot of ATP. But we're also giving off carbon dioxide and water and energy. So it's usually, AT, hopefully, 
you know, the, the byproducts of glucose will go into the mitochondria, not um, proteins or amino acids. So then oxygen in the mitochondria is what helps the process. And using all those molecules we mentioned before, NAD and FAD, processes called the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, we'll learn that probably next lecture, um, cellular respiration, but it happens, aerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria. That's why there's so much mitochondria in those less fatigable cells of the Popeye's chicken thighs, right? Because they have more oxygen, oxygen related respiration, more aerobic cell respiration, and they're less fatigable. Have that, has to do with the, that has to do with the energy system, right? Because they're yeah. more they're like just using oxygen. Yeah, oxygen will make a lot more ATP than anaerobic respiration, which makes very little. And it'll give you more time. Like glycolysis is the breaking down of glucose, right? And it happens in the cytoplasm anaerobically. So that only gives off, I think maybe you get like you'll net like uh, two ATP. But in the mitochondria, especially in a muscle cell, you could net like 32 ATPs. And then you add the two from the cytoplasm. And that's a lot of energy. That's a very efficient cell, like a skeletal muscle cell or a cardiac muscle cell. So the mitochondria has an inner membrane and an outer membrane and the space in between. So it folds up. That's what gives that criste look. It looks like the footprint of a, a shoe, like a, a spaceman shoe. I always thought it looked like that. And the fluid within that crista is called the matrix. So you see a close up of the crista. Criste is singular. And you have the two membranes. Okay. So most cells have a mitochondria because most cells need ATP to run their cellular cycles. All right. So the mitochondria are interesting because it has its own. DNA, you might have heard of mitochondrial DNA. That's in the mitochondria. It's actually, so what, what this tells us is that maybe the mitochondria was, was its own organism that had DNA, like, like a bacteria or not a virus. Well, virus is RNA, but it's a membrane bound structure. And so you could tell some of your genetics using the, only on your mother's side though, it's only you only get this from that double X chromosome from the mom. Okay. So again, if you have mutations in there, it may cause breakdown in homeostasis. So this is what you should know that the mitochondrial DNA is maternal only. So we're learning more about this and we're getting to see more about diseases with mitochondrial DNA and get to know more where you came from with mitochondrial DNA. DNA. Okay, I think we should take a break now. What do you think? Yeah, school cool. time. We get to five thirty, five twenty-one. This is a Phineas and Ferb song about the anglet. That's, that's pretty cool. All right, so what time should we come back? Cat, what do you say? How much time do you need? Uh, let's say four four twenty. Okay. Let's take our time. So the less we talk about, the less we'll be on the exam, right? It'll be easier. You guys all get A's. You guys are going to get A's anyway. We'll be back at 420. Fair enough? All right. I'll see you then.